schools out indefinitely. As parents across America attempt to juggle their work schedules with taking care of their children full time, it's putting enormous stress on families. Carrie McDonald, an education researcher and author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom, says that it's also an opportunity to rethink how we teach our children. McDonald, who also homeschools her own four kids, recommends that parents experiment with radical unschooling, which proposes that kids learn better when they direct their own education. I chatted with her about strategies for struggling parents and why she thinks that this crisis could finally move society from the industrial to the imagination age. Carrie, thank you very much for chatting with me today. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Zach. Great to be with you. First, I know there are, are a lot of parents out there who are under a lot of stress. Uh, the kids are there. They might be working from home and having to juggle that with parenting responsibilities. They might be on leave or out of work. Uh, so I just want to be clear from the top that these are not exactly the ideal conditions for giving homeschooling its first shot. Um, but Sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. Well, this is a really trying time for all of us. Um, we're all experiencing something that we've never experienced before. It's incredibly stressful. You point out, you know, we parents and kids working and learning alongside together, alongside each other. Um, in, interruptions that might come with that. The you know stress of lots of screen time for children and the effects that that might have on family life. And just the overall uncertainty and fear that brings us to this point. Um, and also the fact that parents might have lost jobs or not sure if they have jobs to go back to when this all ends. So it's an incredibly uh, difficult time for everyone. And you're absolutely right that this is nothing like authentic homeschooling. Uh, you know, traditional homeschoolers and, and unschoolers would tell you that this is just as difficult for us uh, as it is for everyone else because we are so separated from our communities. I mean, this, the, the one thing that you find a, a lot of the kind of modern homeschoolers um, experiencing is being immersed in the people, places, and things of our communities. It's not the stereotype of sitting around a kitchen table all day, isolated from the other outer world. It's really um, this authentic socialization in our communities. And of course, all of us are cut off from that experience right now. Um, so I, I hope that people are not turned off by homeschooling <laughs> by this experience that, again, is nothing like what they would encounter in a genuine homeschooling experience. But I do think it can give some glimpses into what learning without schooling might look like. A lot of closed down schools have been sending homework home and day, you know, sometimes daily emails out to parents, trying to keep students on track as much as possible. I have very young kids who are in preschool and even they're getting stuff sent like every day. Um, but what's your advice in terms of trying to, you know, keep up with the curriculum during this time? According to The Economist, about a billion students around the world are out of school due to COVID-19. So this is something that we're all contending with of life without school at the moment. And different uh, schools and different school districts are managing this process differently. So in some cases, um, Young people have a specific curriculum that they must follow, that the school has sent home, that maybe they're logging on virtually from, you know, eight to three every day, and, it, and it's very much like um, a typical school day except at home. I think we're also seeing, though, in many cases, any work that's being sent home is being considered considered op or for enrichment purposes only. The Wall Street Journal had an article about this recently saying that in some major districts, um, education officials can't guarantee that all students have equitable access to technology or connectivity. And as a result of that, they can't mandate any of this work. So, you know, we're seeing schools and districts deal this different the extent that parents have some flexibility the extent that any work that is being sent home is optional or won't count toward um, grades or testing or advancement I think it's a great opportunity for families to disconnect from schooling and see what it might be like to learn without that sort of standardized curriculum and that expectation that we see um, from a standard classroom 
what has the shift been like for you, someone who already had uh, homeschools, but obviously you're, you're much more constricted at this point? Right. So I'm uh, located in uh, Massachusetts and in Boston, Cambridge area. And so we spend most of our time outside of our homes, uh, taking classes in the community, going to the library, going to museums, gathering with friends, going to the park and playgrounds, um, all sorts of things that, of course, we're not able to do. And so our lives have changed in very much the same way that everyone's lives have changed now, um, again, being isolated at home. Um, disconnected from from friends, disconnected from our daily routines. So, but what I can say is that I do think that homeschooling and the uh, process of living and learning alongside children um, is something that families can begin to get a glimpse of now in a way that they may not otherwise have had that opportunity um, to really get to know their kids a little bit more. What are some of their interests? What are some of their curiosities? And again, and to the extent that families are able to move away from a standardized curriculum or maybe just spend a couple of hours a day on whatever the school has sent home, leaving all kinds of unstructured time with their children, this may be a wonderful opportunity for children's natural creativity and curiosity to reemerge, right? I mean, young children are incredibly enthusiastic about learning, right? They're always asking questions. You said you have young children. They are just full of energy and uh, excitement for discovery. And then what happens so often is they enter a standard schooling situation and they learn conformity and obedience and compliance to a curriculum. And so those natural drives for learning can sometimes be turned off. And this is this incredible moment to potentially turn those drives for learning back on. And to see, for example, a reluctant reader all of a sudden be really interested in reading because you're giving that child the freedom to read whatever he or she is interested in. Or maybe you're reading together as a family in ways that you hadn't had a chance to before when all of us were on the go and we had so many activities uh, in our own lives. Yeah. So this could be a really great uh, opportunity for families to get gather together and connect in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. The worry that I often hear is, well, they're just going to sit around and play video games or look at their phone all day. Is that, um, how do you get around that? Or do you just like let them do that? Or are they eventually going to get bored and do something else? What's your advice with regards to screen time and just being a couch potato? Well, I think there's two responses to that. There's the immediate response of what we're all experiencing currently, where technology is frankly a lifeline for parents and children alike. And so I think, um, you know, it's understandable that parents have concerns around technology under typical circumstances. I think, um, you know, often just like sugar, sometimes parents might see the negative impact of too much screen time on their children. Um, but I do think that because we're in such extraordinary circumstances right now, we should uh, loosen some of those limits just because it's, again, a way of connecting with the outside world uh, and not worry so much about it. I think that'll also take some of the stress off of parents who may be worrying, oh my goodness, my, my child is watching so much TV or is always on, on, the tech, on technology while I'm trying to do calls or I'm trying to get my work done. And because this is such a stressful situation for parents and children, children are just as stressed and they're seeing the stress that parents have, um, loosening a little bit on those technology limits and not feeling so bad about technology, at least in these early uh, weeks of this, I think is really going to take the pressure off of families and be a relief. The upside of the technology that I've noticed is just being able to, you know, the, the social isolation is obviously a big problem for everyone and um, being able to FaceTime with parents and even uh, you know, friends and uh, our preschool has been doing Zoom meetups where they do show and tell, which has been fun for them. Um, I mean, what are some of the ways that you've seen or recommend technology actually be leveraged, you know, for positive uh, at this moment? Everything that you've said, I think we're seeing these ways of, of virtual connection through Zoom and Google Hangouts. Um, older kids are playing Minecraft video games through a multiplayer world where, you know, they're interacting with their friends or they have FaceTime with their friends while they're playing the video game. 
There's another game called Prodigy Math, which is free, and it's a wonderful math software. It's often used in the schools as well, and that's another multiplayer kind of video game world. So there are these ways that kids can connect. Um, I've seen also, you know, Google Docs. Uh, some of the, the materials being sent home from schools are being put onto Google Docs, worksheets and assignments. But you'll find too that, that kids, when they're able to collaborate with their friends and their classmates, might start using Google Docs to develop a story together or a script together. Um, so there are these wonderful ways to leverage technology right now and, and make up for that lost physical connection that we're all feeling. I think the other reason why we should loosen some of the limits that we might have typically had on technology at this point is because there are so many resources, free resources now available to us, organizations that typically would charge for their services. Many of them are offering these free, uh, this free content. Uh, it's just really mm -hmm. incredible. You have 2,500 museums around the world with virtual tours. You have uh, symphony orchestras that are streaming their performances. Um, and then, you know, other learning tools like Khan Academy, of course, has always been free online videos for kids. They have more resources for families. Uh, even companies like Varsity Tutors, which is an online tutoring platform that you would typically pay for, are offering their services for free. So there's, this is just a unique opportunity to be exposed to content and experiences that we may otherwise not have had a chance to. A lot of parents might be just worried that if, especially if we're talking about high school kids, that they're going to start just falling behind in whatever subjects they're, they're currently studying. How concerning is that for you? Is, and is there any way to, you know, combat that if we're going to be losing possibly several months of time? I think there's a lot of talk about what's being lost, yeah. um, what is, what, what learning isn't occurring. Mm -hmm. And I would like to flip that a little, say what learning will occur. I mean, this experience is a defining moment for all of us, but particularly for our children's uh, childhood and their lifetime. This will be something that they will look back on and that will really shape their future and their perspectives. So there is an incredible amount of learning for them um, over the next several weeks or months. And I think that we should acknowledge just how much they will learn and these new perspectives they will gain. And the one story that I have found fascinating that's come out of this um, pandemic is the story of Isaac Newton, who in 1665 was a young college student in England and all the colleges shut down due to the bubonic plague that hit London. And all of the college students had to go back to their homes, just like is happening now, of course, uh, what we're experiencing. And Isaac Newton was one of those college students, went back to his childhood home. And it would be called his year of wonders when he was away from professors and curriculum and his typical assignments is when he uh, invented calculus and discovered gravity and came up with his theory of optics um, because he had this freedom to explore and to learn and to discover. And I think that could be a model for us. As difficult as this is, this could be an incredibly productive period um, for both parents and children. It could really unleash some creativity if we allow young people to separate from a schooling mindset. Hmm. So yeah, this, the schooling mindset is really what you go after in your book, um, that you're trying to separate the idea of learning from formal schooling. Um, and and uh, that brings us to the topic of what's become known as unschooling. Um, and uh, it's, an, it's an educational philosophy that began to pick up steam in the 80s as espoused by an educator named John Holt. School is a place where children learn to be stupid. And the process that makes them stupid, at least stupid in school, is other people trying to control their learning. That's John Holt, who's the intellectual godfather of the modern homeschooling movement. In a sense, he's the moral leader of a movement in this country on the part of a significant number of American families to take their kids out of school and teach them at home. There's a common perception that homeschoolers are social conservatives who want to shield their children from the modern world. But it's good for the child to get out of the home, get away from mom and dad, and, and talk to other people because when they become adults, they've got that problem. But Holt had a different view of the dangers of schooling. 
In his 10 books, Holt argued that children were capable of self-directed learning, possessing a natural curiosity that's quashed by modern schools. They treat them like an empty receptacles into which they are going to pour whatever learning they think they ought to have. One such example is the Houston Sudbury School, based on the Sudbury Valley School model pioneered in Massachusetts in 1968. Students here who range in age from 6 to 17 play and learn with each other, attend optional lessons in various subjects, and each have an equal vote on how the school is run and money allocated. So uh, what are the insights from the unschooling philosophy that you think are most applicable to our current situation? He defined unschooling as taking children out of school. Uh, it has since evolved, I think, to be more associated with this uh, idea of self-directed education. So if we think of uh, typical homeschooling, um, some homeschooling families might replicate school at home. And so all that's really changing in terms of education is the location. And unschoolers, or those who sort of um, focus more on the self-directed education philosophy would say that schooling is one method of education, regardless of if it takes place in a school or some other location, but there's other ways to be educated. And in allowing people to set their own path, to focus on their own interests and passions, so much learning will occur. And of course, as I say in my book, and I, and I repeat frequently, it's a parent's responsibility to ensure that their children are highly literate and numerate, that they're well-educated. And I think that that's true whether your children are in school or out of school. Mm. But I think there are ways that we can facilitate those, uh, the, that strong education and these curious individuals um, by allowing for a non-coercive learning environment that um, stimulates their interests and passions and reveals their gifts. The person who wrote the introduction to your book, uh, Peter Gray, a psychologist who studied this kind of self-directed learning um, when he observed the original Sudbury School, um, and that the Sudbury School, which we, we referenced one in, in the pr previous clip, it basically allows kids not only to make their own curriculum, but kind of democratically come up with the rules of the school itself. Um, could you give us some highlights of whatever research is actually out there about self-directed learning and what kind of results uh, we see, whether, whether or not it actually works, just for parents who are worried about, you know, kind of unleashing <laughs> their kids and uh, really no learning of any sort happening? I think it's important to note that even under the umbrella term of unschooling, there is a wide assortment of um, approaches and different ways that families um, tackle self-directed education. So, and I, and I highlight the Houston Sudbury School in um, my unschooled book, as well as a variety of other self-directed learning centers, unschooling families, unschooling alumni. And you see this diversity of practice and, and, uh, and approaches. I think the, the underlying focus though, is on this sense of having learning be not non-coercive, so really focusing on freedom over force and encouraging individual gifts to emerge within our children. Hmm. Um, so some of the research, and you're right to point out Peter Gray, who's just such a, a wonderful advocate for self-directed education and unschooling, has done some fantastic research in this area. One of the uh, surveys that, that he and a colleague did on grown unschoolers found that grown unschoolers had no trouble getting into college should they choose. Many of them took community college classes during their teenage years and did fine, and took the SATs and did fine, and then were able to enter college, um, did fine, <laughs> were able to adapt effectively to college, uh, and to college and career. But I thought one of the most interesting findings from this particular survey of grown unschoolers was that um, more than half of the individuals surveyed in jobs uh, that were entrepreneurial and tied to interests that emerged during childhood or adolescence. So the sense of uh, encouraging personal agency, creativity, and an entrepreneurial spirit can really be cultivated uh, through unschooling. The pandemic right now um, 
It's causing a lot of people to question things about the world, I think, and their assumptions. Um, some people have the sense that a lot of things are going to be permanently changed after this, much in the same way 9-11 shifted the paradigm in many areas of our lives. Um, is that a sense you have when it comes to how we view education in America? Uh, will this permanently shake things up in some fundamental way, um, or is this really kind of a blip? Look, many families are going to be delighted to get back to their typical routines of work and school. I think all of us will be very glad when this is over and we can return to a sense of normalcy. But I would be very surprised if we don't see an uptick in families choosing homeschooling or virtual learning or some other kind of alternative to school. I'm already seeing this. A neighbor of mine, for instance, just said, uh, when I asked at a six foot distance, uh, how's it going? And she said, oh, my child is just flourishing. She's writing mm -hmm. stories, she's reading books, she's devouring math. Uh, and I said, you know, gee, maybe you'll continue this. And she said, we're really going to consider this. I think that's going to be the case for some families, especially families that have been intrigued by the, by the idea of homeschooling or an alternative to school. This is their moment to give it a shot. And they may find, again, their kids are calmer, they're happier, they're more curious, uh, they're doing interesting things, they're learning amazing things uh, without schooling, which will be, uh, I think, revealing for, the, for parents. And they'll want to continue that. And I, I, so I really think we're on the brink of a, of a real education reset in the same way that Hurricane Katrina caused a, a huge education shift in New Orleans after the hurricane in 2005, and Terry Moe from Stanford University wrote a book recently called um, The Politics of Institutional Reform, where he spotlighted how Hurricane Katrina led to a nearly all charter school district hmm. in New Orleans that really couldn't have happened had it not been for that level of, uh, of a disaster, a natural disaster, to um, break up some bureaucracies and cause some real institutional shifts. Speaking of charter schools, I wonder like whether or not um, homeschooling per se takes off. Like, is this uh, the self-directed learning approach? Is there any hope of getting that incorporated a bit more into school, like traditional schools or charter schools? Um, or I, I believe John Holt uh, himself believed that was not a possibility, which is why he advocated homeschooling, but where do you fall on that? Do you think it's just kind of impossible to reform the schools in this way and homeschooling is the only path forward if you want a more self-directed approach? Or are there ways to implement some of this in the broader system? Well, as I was writing my book, I was very hopeful for an experiment uh, just outside of Boston near me in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, what was to be a fully self-directed um, high school, district school, not a charter school. Hmm. And it was really um, aiming to incorporate these unschooling principles. The founder um, was influenced by John Holt and Ivan Illich, definitely believed in this idea of allowing emergent learning to occur and, and not having it be a top-down process. It was, it was this dream school, if we were to imagine anything that was to happen in a public school looking like unschooling, this was it. In fact, they won a $10 million grant from the XQ Super Schools Innovative School uh, Fund because the idea was so exciting and promising. And everything was set up. They had um, superintendent support. They had teachers union support. The community was really excited about it. And as my book went to print, they were set to open this past fall of, of 2019. And um, in March, so just like a, a month or two before my book came out last year, the school committee unanimously decided not to approve the opening of the school. Mm -hmm. And it was just a shock. And NPR wrote a big piece about it, the Boston Globe, um, because it was really set up in so many ways to be this one experiment to see if self-directed learning could happen in school with everything going for it and then to have it um, to have it paused in that way or halted really was just heartbreaking and the main reason was the sense that because not everyone could participate in the school then no one could 
Yeah, that's uh, that doesn't bode well. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, the the biggest because the biggest hurdle I see like for homeschooling, honestly, is that when you have two working parents, it seems difficult if if not impossible. And like dual income households seem to have been holding steady for a couple decades now, around sixty percent. Um, it almost seems like home like for homeschooling or unschooling to really take off, people would need to adopt a whole different mindset, which you do discuss a little bit in your book. Um, is there anything that leads you to believe that a new mindset is emerging or forthcoming? I think families are finding that they can adopt um, homeschooling and unschooling and continue to be two, two working parents or single parents. Um, for example, even just, again, this experiment with digital learning, families will realize that they don't have to be the ones sitting down and teaching their children, that mm. there are these incredible resources available um, that can educate their children, like Khan Academy can, can manage a child's math uh, education or my older daughter takes Korean classes and it's a Korean tutor who she's working with. I don't know Korean. Um, so as a parent, we're just connecting our children to available resources. Mm -hmm. I think another trend that we're seeing is the hybrid homeschooling models um, where a young person might go to a learning center or a micro school for a couple of days a week or even potentially full time but are registered as homeschoolers. So, mm. so homeschooling really becomes the legal lever to put parents back in charge of their child's education and allow for this freedom and flexibility that wouldn't be possible with typical public or private schools. Good. So there's much more flexibility there, uh, again, around hybrid homeschooling, yeah, networks of low cost in-home micro schools like the Prenda micro school network coming out of Arizona. Mm. Um, in some cases, for that one, they're it's tied to virtual charter schools and uh, education savings accounts, these other kinds of school choice mechanisms that can um, allow for some more education innovation experimentation. So I think we're going to see much more of that. I think after families have a taste of a different kind of education, they're going to demand more education choice. They're going to want more options and hopefully will also encourage um, more uh, education entrepreneurship to build mm. these new models. It's interesting because, uh, yeah, you're kind of changing the way that uh, I've thought about homeschooling a little bit in terms of you imagine the parents more as the teacher and, and what you're sketching out here, the parent is kind of just shepherding the child towards different areas of interest or education options, which makes sense because not everyone is a good teacher. You're kind of questioning the fundamentals of the current education system. And I feel like to really understand why those need questioning, it, it helps to understand why it is the way in the first place. And mm. again, your, your book does delve into this and you zero in on um, Horace Mann and the Prussian model. It's kind of the, the starting point. Uh, what was going on back in the early 19th century that laid the foundation for what we have today? Well, I think it's, it's even uh, further back than that. So if mm. we go back to the 1640s, not long after the Pilgrims landed uh, in Ma what was then Massachusetts Bay Colony, they established the, the colony's first compulsory education law mm. that said that the state had an interest in educated citizenry. But the compulsion was on uh, towns, city and cities and towns of certain sizes would have to hire a teacher and or open and operate a grammar school. So it was the town that was required by the state to provide education resources for those families that wanted them. Um, but it was not the parents who were required to send their children there. And in fact, homeschooling was, of course, the default. The expectation was that parents would be the ones educating their children, but they weren't always the ones doing that education. Even then, there were game schools, which were like these little nursery schools in your neighbor's kitchen to teach young kids um, the three R's and let their mom you know, get things done around the house. There were uh, apprenticeship programs. There were tutors that would come and, and offer guidance. So an array of different education approaches, and of course, public and private schools were also available. Um, this all changes in 1852, when Horace Mann uh, and his colleagues become the architects of 
um, of compulsory schooling. And so for the first time, parents are compelled to send their children to school under a legal threat of force. And that was a, a, a huge sea change from what education was previously. And you're absolutely right that it was these education reformers in the mid 19th century who were fascinated by the Prussian model of education that focused on obedience and compliance and orderliness uh, and, and coercion, really, to, um, to build a, a solid group of factory workers that would um, help you know, build the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, really. And that was exciting to a lot of these reformers. This was also a time of mass immigration, particularly in Massachusetts. Um, a lot of Irish Catholic immigrants uh, pouring into the streets of Boston in particular, which threatened the dominant Anglo-Saxon Protestant ethos of the time. And so common schools, these uh, compulsory schools that were created, were really uh, designed to Americanize these immigrants and to, um, to teach them what it was like to live an appropriate life uh, in, in the United States. Um, so they were purportedly secular, but they had the King James Bible, they had Protestant teachers, um, and they really had a specific worldview that a lot of families, including Catholics, rejected and actually went off and uh, created their own uh, network of Catholic schools um, mm -hmm. to get away from that, that sort of system, systemized uh, methods of education. Yeah, and uh, I mean, an interesting fact I picked up from your book was that man actually homeschooled his own kids. Uh, so the kind of rigid, it was like rigid compulsory schooling for me, but not for thee. Uh, I feel like we still see that dynamic at play sometimes in the education debate. We do. I think that that hypocrisy of, um, well, this is for other people's children, but not for my children, or, you know, I will continue to exercise choice for my kids, but um, we have to make sure that everyone else is forced into a government system of mass schooling. Mm -hmm. um, that is the is the piece that I think is is we really need to call out. That's the most frustrating, um, and the really the most pernicious. So, if the motivation, or I guess the effect of the horseman Prussian approach was to kind of prepare workers for this industrial base that then would fuel the industrial revolution. We're now in a different era, but this, this model still persists to some degree. Um, you call it in your book, you say that a lot of people talk about the information age, which you call it the imagination age. What does that mean to you? Why do you think we're in the imagination age? What does that mean for schooling? And what does that mean you know, for the future? Right, so I didn't uh, coin the term the imagination age. I go through uh, some of its uh, evolution in the book. It's often called the innovation era, but it's basically um, you know, the next stage after the industrial revolution, right? And even in some ways past the information age where human creativity and imagination are what really are going to separate us from robots. And yet we have a system of compulsory mass schooling from the 19th century that is very um, efficient at creating what are essentially robotic humans. You go through these, this orderly process and you tick all the boxes and then you come out all shiny and learned at the end. And I think what we're seeing is that through that process often uh, those essential human qualities of creativity and curiosity and inventiveness and an entrepreneurial spirit can be crushed or at least dulled. And yet those are the human qualities that are so critical as we, as we coexist with robots. You know, what separates humans from robots? It is these essential human qualities around uh, human imagination that will um, create the, the next great inventions and hopefully enable us to prevent or um, better deal with some of these global crises like we're currently experiencing. And I mean, as this global crisis kind of belatedly kicks off the 21st century here, what do you see as a realistic path towards improving the way American kids get educated moving forward once the dust settles from the pandemic? Yes, I think, again, 
and families will see a different way of learning. They will um, hopefully, among all of the stress and tension that they're experiencing at home, will find those moments where they can connect with their children in ways they weren't able to before and see how much they really are able to learn when they're given the freedom uh, to do that. And again, because we have these incredible digital resources for free right now um, to take advantage of, I think parents will also see that it's really the technology that will make self-directed education or other education uh, models more possible because of, uh, of the ways that technology provides us with all of these different resources and approaches. So it's not just families feeling the pressure that they have to educate their children. It's really seeing that, that technology can, um, can facilitate that. And in some ways, it's also looking at how we as adults learn um, whether it's now through this pandemic, uh, I mentioned Isaac Newton, I'm devouring biographies <laughs> about Isaac Newton now and, um, and watching, you know, documentaries uh, about him. But I think it's also recognizing, again, the way adults learn, what do, how do we become interested in things? And then what do we do to satisfy that curiosity? And increasingly, it's using digital technology to do that. And I think mm. it's just acknowledging that young people learn the same way. They have, those, they have their own interests and their own passions, and they'll be able to leverage technology uh, as well. And once we emerge from our social distancing uh, back into our communities, then we're connected with all of those real resources as well that make learning that much more uh, rewarding and uh, impactful.